I'm Christian Rades and I've been a professional PHP developer for the last three years at Shopware. And um, not only do I live in uh, rural shopping where Shopware is based, it looks like this, so really nothing much to, to go on about, just meadows, some cows, a few trees, you know, just normal village stuff, more cows than people. And uh, so there are two things I can talk about. Trees and beer. <laughs> so um, today it's going to be trees, but maybe next time beer, so I'll keep an eye out for that. And um, the thing is, today I'm going to talk a bit about forests and trees, as the talk said. And forests are a very cultivated thing nowadays. I mean, they might look rough and tumble, but in fact, a lot of forests are maintained by humans going through there and um, taking care, like this guy. And um, these people, they, you know, they measure the trees, they cut them down if they're rotten, and they're caretakers. And the thing I want to drive home is, you are caretakers as well for your software. I mean, kind of, you don't go out in the forest and cut down trees, but I mean, the metaphor still works. Probably. Um, right, but what kinds of trees does your, um, does your application contain? Uh, I've got this here as a little example. I mean, it's, it's just a pseudo, pseudo call trace. You know, you have a controller uh, at the checkout route. The checkout will fetch some users from the database, will fetch a card from the database, and then, uh, you know, calculate the bill and then you render it. So, you know, a normal call graph. And um, keeping, keeping your trees in order when they are small and well-groomed is easy, right? Having an application that, was already, or that has already been uh, taken care of well and uh, has been developed with things like clean code in mind are often easier to keep in that state. But the thing is, most people who start to use stuff like uh, static analysis, they encounter more something like this. And uh, the thing is, it's really hard to get order into that and to start um, changing it for the better. Because you have to know some, um, you know, you have to have values, metrics, stuff like that. And so, um, enough for the trees for now. The thing... Um, I want to talk about first is readability, you know, as a cornerstone of like getting your trees in order. And um, I mean, we all know about code style readability. It's quite important because readability is uh, not only for the developers maintaining the code base, you know, searching through it, but also it's important for, you know, just the first the first um, way you see it, right? How you, how you feel about the code when it's properly indented, stuff like that. So you don't just go in a code base and think, oh my God, like what's happening here? It's not even formatted properly. Um, and you've got stuff like indentation, line breaks, maximum uh, line width. Uh, you got the occasional stray uh, space. And the thing is, it's not only, I mean, it's quite obvious but it's hard to get right because in a code review, for example, you only have a limited amount of time to really do some concentrated looking through the code. So every second you spend thinking about like, is this space too much or is this indented uh, not properly? You will lose uh, concentrated time thinking about stuff like data flow and um, the general idea of what this pull request is trying to do. So the thing is, style issues are boring. Um, you don't want to bicker about uh, how long lines should be or when to put a new line, stuff like that, or should you use comments, shouldn't you use comments. And um, the tooling for that is quite well explored. So we have easy coding standard. And um, the nice thing about easy coding standard is that it combines two tools. You have, on the one hand, PHP CS Fixer. Um, this does a lot of, you know, the, the standard, the standard uh, layout stuff, like, you know, line width, 
uh, spaces, and you've got the PHP code sniffer, which also does some uh, cleanliness checks. And they, um, they work quite well in conjunction. You also, got st um, you also have some custom rules, and you can um, just use ECS out of the box because it's already got an opinionated collection of lints and uh, style formatters that can automatically bring your code in line. So, after this quick, uh, quick detour to readability, we're back to the trees, uh, like here. And today, I'm not <laughs> only want to talk about like green trees, but um, PHP itself, the language, also has trees. It's uh, actually what inquired the horrible pun that is my title. And um, it's the abstract syntax tree. It's been in PHP since uh, PHP 7. It was put in there by Nikita Popov, and um, it enabled the language to be more memory efficient and uh, be a bit quicker with the compiling and also made, more, uh, made the PHP runtime more maintainable. And um, I mean, I could show you a PHP syntax tree, but uh, they are quite big, so let's start a bit smaller, like this. Uh, because as it turns out, math has some kind of syntax tree as well. You can pass a mathematical term like this one here um, as a tree. And why is this a good idea? Because um, if you just read this term left to right, you get the wrong answer, obviously, because it's not 6 times 3. It's, um, it's uh, uh, I can't do math right now. No, <laughs> been a long day, standing all the time. We don't have chairs at the shop where I stand outside. But um, the thing is, uh, the, the right answer is 10, obviously. And um, to get to this answer, the computer has to build a model about precedence. And you can represent this model about precedence um, with trees, right? You have to first uh, figure out what, is, um, what are the arguments for your addition. And after you figure out, uh, and to figure that out, you need to figure out what is, um, what is the result of the multiplication. And so you can then um, just collapse your tree and get out the right answer. Uh, to give you an example about how big these abstract syntax trees in PHP can get. Uh, I've just taken the Shopware 6 uh, index PHP and run a line code on it, like 104 lines. That's not much code. I mean, everybody can keep that in their head and think about it, stuff like that. But if I run the PHP parser on it and output the AST to JSON, suddenly it's like 35-fold in volume. So um, you have no chance to think about that manually, right? Just reading through the AST, that won't happen. And so I want to show you two tools to help you with that. The first one is uh, the, uh, some older tool. It's called PHP Stan. And uh, it does basically the job of looking through the syntax tree, finding some weird parts, some maybe erroneous parts, and telling this to you. And um, one of the main uh, main of the uh, one of the main pros of PHP Stan is its easy config. Um, the configuration itself has um, nine levels. That's all you need to do. You need to decide what level to take. Uh, level zero is the most permissive, so it only finds stuff like syntax errors there. And level 8 is the most restrictive. So it looks into stuff like types and that code, logical conditions. And um, to run it, you know, it's really just you give it the level, you point it to your source directory, and off you go. PHP then will look through your code. And it's not that slow as well. So lots of people may be thinking, oh, static analysis. It will take quite a while. I think we run our like 3,000 files in, I don't know, five minutes, maybe 10. But um, this is obviously a bit much for day-to-day, -day, for 
day-to-day -day development, like having it continuously run after every code change, but it's um, good enough to run it per merge request. So you just know if you're building um, errors into your software that don't need to be there. The other thing that's really cool about PHP Stan is that you can define custom rules. So these custom rules are just PHP files implementing some methods um, that PHP Stan calls to check out the tree with custom information. Um, for example, um, at Shopper, we are more of a vendor kind of uh, software. And so um, we have to take care that our code is usable for third-party developers. And so we need to make clear to our own developers and people who might work on it later that uh, we want clear interfaces, for example, through decoration. And so we implemented an annotation called add decoratable that makes sure that the class that is uh, marked with add decoratable is properly decoratable through Symfony services and uh, we don't accidentally break this decoratableness because uh, of some later change. We don't get direct feedback about things like these because we don't decorate our services ourselves, but other people will, and we don't have their code bases. So uh, we would you know, just break code somewhere else and we wouldn't know about it. So we implemented a few of these checks that all fit into this, this class is decoratable uh, category. And I mean, obviously, it needs to implement an interface. So we've written a rule that checks, does it implement any interface? Then we have a rule that says, um, you know, does not add another public method, because you can't decorate the methods that aren't in the interface. You know, stuff like that. It's not using any of their own methods. And uh, this is why we're using PHP then. And some people think you only need to, or you only can run one static analysis, and if you're running more than one tool, uh, they might have overlap. But as it turns out, with Psalm, you're still getting um, added benefits of running both tools at once. The thing is, that's so awesome about Psalm, which, by the way, is developed by Vimeo. Um, is that it has an extended type system. It puts a lot of effort into building uh, additional typing into PHP. Uh, even stuff like pseudo uh, generics um, with their templating mechanism. And um, the typing system adds other things as well, like for example, union types. Um, they do exist in the type annotation that, um, that is pretty common in PHP, like you know, just annotating types instead of uh, putting them directly in the function body, uh, or not function body, but function signature. And um, for example, with the weird functions like the string functions that may return a zero or false, you can even take like enum values, like directly false. It cannot be an integer or true or false, you know, int or bool, but it is either int or false. And with that annotation, you can find errors later down the line where maybe somebody cast the result of this operation down to a bool. Because if you cast this operation down to a bool, um, somewhere to maybe fit into another function signature that expects booleans, um, it will never be true. So this is able to find that code. The other thing is uh, it adds typed arrays, something that uh, we cannot have in the PHP core itself because it would be too slow. <coughs> Excuse me. The thing about um, typed arrays in PHP is that um, arrays it's their set, uh, themselves are quite, um, are quite pliable you can throw a lot of stuff in PHP arrays, and um, if you were to have them type-checked, you have to run the check on every single item, on every single array operation, and that would just be too slow. So we do it in you know, some kind of compile step, like the static analysis that Psalm does. 
Um, and as you can see, we can not only define, um, define the value of the array, but if it's an associ associative array, sorry, um, you can also define the key type. If we define the key type as int, it's like a normal non-associative array. And um, by now, I think PHP stand supports the same notation. So there, a PHP stand and Psalm work in conjunction, and if you define it in the Psalm notation, PHP stand will most likely also help you finding bugs due to typing mistakes. The next thing is that's quite uh, special to Psalm is it's got object-like arrays. Psalm is, uh, as, as of my knowledge, the only tool that does it, but you can even type in certain keys in your associative arrays. So uh, what looks like a JSON, uh, a JSON object um, basically guarantees that whatever is written in the V variable here has to contain a item under the key value and an item under the key name. And um, this is, of course, useful for APIs and stuff like that, because you can write assertions for that. Simon does know about that as well. You can say, right, it asserts that um, the array has a key, a key value pair, you know, value and an object type foo. And once you've run this assertion on your input data, all the code that comes after it uh, will, be treated, uh, will be treated like this is a valid assumption. And so you can find even more bugs and you are forced by Psalm basically to have a proper input validation. But I mean, I can talk all day about you know, language quirks, but the question that comes up is why even care about type safety? And excuse me for the lot of drinking, uh, my mouth is quite dry today. Mm. But the thing is, have a look at this. This is a real life example. We found it in our code. I mean, it's quite, uh, quite small. And somebody wanted to sort an array. So they uh, gave it an anonymous function that uh, sorted by the value of type. And this looks correct, right? You have a, a greater than part there. But once we've run Psalm on it, it says invalid Scala argument. So, I mean, in this case, I reproduce it, so that's why it's in the main PHP and like at the top of the file. And um, it found out that the callable you give it re uh, must return an integer. But the callable that we had here returns a bool. What does that mean? Um, it means that you sort under the hood will cast your bool to an integer. And you might say, yeah, okay, so why should I care? The thing is, um, it represents not only if an item is larger than another one, it represents the cases an item is larger than the previous, an item is equal, and an item is smaller. So what you should do, like here, uh, or what you should do is, uh, excuse me, is you need to produce a value between minus one and one so that uh, the usort function knows how, they, uh, how these two items relate to each other. And it even says in the PHP manual that if two members compare equal, their ordering is not guaranteed. So while it might work for, you know, I don't know, might work for, for years even, but suddenly a little change that uh, throws around the ordering of the array before it is sorted might change the sorting after it is sorted, which is a total no-go, because in this case, PHP, PHP cannot, uh, cannot tell if A is smaller than B or is equal to B. And so the fix is quite easy. I mean, you just have to swap out the operator. PHP even provides one for that. But um, this was just to show you that type uh, safety really is something you should care about. And, um, but there's another thing I, wanted to talk you, uh, I want to show you. And this is metrics. Because the thing is, 
um, we can try and satisfy tooling all we want, but we might still want to have, a, have an easily parsable uh, quality measure, a way to uh, know if your software is going, to, uh, is going in the right direction, right? If it becomes more maintainable, not less. You know, people have to measure trees to know if they are sick. And um, the first tool I have uh, here for you is DebtTrack. Um, DebtTrack itself uh, can be configured through a dependency file. And this, again, is a real-world example on a project I worked on uh, like two years ago. Um, it was quite a legacy project, and we tried to refactor it, get it more maintainable, so uh, we could put it a bit on the back burner. And um, I mean, first of all, you just tell it where does it find the software components uh, in our component folder. And uh, we don't want the relationships of our test files with it because, I mean, tests are tests. They can do whatever they want as long as they make sure that uh, software works correctly. And then this is the cool part. You can customize um, what for depth track constitutes a module, a dependency. It's because if you plot out every class and their relationships to each other, you will just get, you know, giant graph with like a million lines and you can't tell it apart from each other very good. Um, this, is act this problem has actually has a name, it's called uh, the big ball of mud. Uh, because you arrange your classes in a circle and then print out their, print out their relationships uh, as lines in the circle. And for most software projects of a medium size, it just turns into one big black circle where you can't tell anything apart. So we define our layers, for example, you know, a CDN layer. And um, <clears throat> the collector is what actually does the assignment of the classes to the respective modules. So in this case, we just go through the class names. You have in this case a regex, and uh, this regex just checks the fully qualified class name. So this is quite important because maybe um, you want to have modules that span several, several namespaces or just at some point further down have like a common ancestor or something, so you can specify uh, whole parts of the namespace there. Then you can define your rule set, because the nice thing about depth track is that you can teach it what kind of dependencies do you want to avoid. Because, I mean, this is the reason we're doing this, to figure out where we make mistakes. And so in this case, we have two components that really contain cross-cutting concerns. They're called SDK and common. You know, stuff like logging, messaging, stuff like that you'd find in uh, these two modules. And uh, we basically tell uh, DebtTrack that every module is allowed to have dependencies on these two cross-cutting concerns, but not on anything else. So it took like, I don't know, an afternoon to get working. And after we ran it, we found this. Um, I mean, we, ha we don't have that many modules, but you have to keep in mind that each of these modules contains tons and tons of classes themselves. So, um, you know, stuff like the updater was like the main component, and that's why uh, the other components depended on it. For example, here the indexer, and what we call the social network. And um, the problem that was uh, becoming obvious here was that we had an application that was instead of you know, a distributed monolith, which is badly architectured um, microservices, where every microservice knows about every other microservice and uh, constantly works with everything else, and you don't have any clear path for your data to take, we had something similar in a monolith. Uh, we had components that wanted to be uh, modularized quite strongly, but they didn't because at some point some developer, probably inadvertently even, um, built up dependencies because it was just you know, the quick way to go through there. So we came up with the idea to just use um, um, 
XML RPC because we used XML RPC in that project for some other things. And um, to take all these dependencies and move them to an RPC interface so that the modules don't have to know about each other anymore. And after the first, I think, month, three weeks around that, we were at this stage where we reduced the, um, the wrong dependencies by like 40. Then, after, um, you know, like two more months' time, we, did, uh, we put quite a lot of work into this, um, we got this, which is perfectly fine, and it becomes easy to understand that the SDK and the common bundle are cross-cutting concerns. They're, based, they're forming a layer below the rest. So um, this, is, this is what just simple dependency tracking can do for you. It can make it obvious where there are like hotbeds you want to refactor. The next tool um, is PHP metrics. Um, PHP metrics is has quite the feature, uh, quite quite the amount of features, as you can see by uh, the dots on there. Um, and the thing is, it can output like totally totally simple stuff, like lines of code. I mean, I did it with you know a 30-year-old Unix command, so that's nothing special. Um, you have stuff like Cyclomatic complexity, um, if you don't know cyclomatic complexity, it basically models statically how many paths there are through a function. So um, when you've got a function, I mean, that is a cyclomatic complexity of, I believe, zero, it might be one, and nothing happens there. You know, data goes in, data might come out, easy. But when you introduce an if, suddenly you have two ways your data can go through the function. It might go into that if, it might not, depending on a condition. And so your cyclomatic complexity increases. And then when you've got a loop in there, you have even more possibilities, like the loop might not loop once, it might uh, terminate somewhere in between, so you got even more. And if you put, uh, you know, ifs in loops and loops and loops and stuff like that, cyclomatic complexity balloons up. So it is a measure of how complicated code is to understand. Because after all, we are not computers. If we run, uh, if we read this code, we might not spot all the ways in this this function performs. And um, so it's a good thing to keep track of. But as uh, as I can tell you, if you try and write uh, or use test-driven development, cyclomatic complexity tends to stay quite low per default. But if you're not using test-driven development, which basically most of us, I included, um, it will be a good measure of what functions should be tested more intensely. right? Because if your function has a high cyclomatic complexity of like 10, 15, or even 20, you know, it's like, maybe a hundred lines long, and you only got one test for it, that test might better be like, gigantic to test through all the different cases in that functions, or you have a problem, because <coughs> there might be a code path that behaves completely, un, um, and completely unknown. So, um, also what's pretty neat is the distributions of the lines of codes. You have... Um, a nice graph with percentiles, like, I don't know, the 50th percentile of your classes is below 50 lines of code, stuff like that. Um, and like the 95th percentile is like 400. Uh, these numbers I've got from Twig. I just uh, had a bit of spare time uh, like last week and ran it on Twig. Quite fast, by the way. I mean, Twig is not that big, but it's also not, snow, uh, not small. And it took like, I don't know, 10 seconds to run through it. This does not even, as far as I know, does not even build a abstract syntax tree. It really only looks at the code as text. Then you've got uh, quite the curious measure here, the average bucks per class. Now, um, a 
a proper question for that would be, well, how do you know how many bugs are in code if you don't run it, you don't test it, you just look at it as text? But this was the idea of some computer scientists like 40 years ago. He basically looked at how many unique operators do you have in your code, stuff like addition, function calls, um, stuff like return statements, and how many unique operands do you have, like variables, um, I mean, all kinds of variables, like static variables, stuff like that. And by these measures, you can um, calculate how complex a piece of software is, and then you can infer from this complexity through experimental results how probable it is that your code will contain a bug. This is, of course, a bit of divining. You know, it, it's, it's uh, a pretty general measure. So even very good code bases will have some number that is greater than zero by uh, about average bugs per class, but um, it might give you a good indication of how probable it is that your code does something you don't expect it to. Uh, then it got efferent coupling and efferent coupling. I hope I uh, said that right. I always get them mixed up, and as a non-native speaker, efferent and efferent are uh, not the easiest to say either. And the thing is about efferent coupling, it's basically uh, inward. Uh, it's inward coupling. So if you have a class and this class gets depended upon by other classes from your, from your module, this is afferent coupling. Uh, this basically means that the class is just used a lot in your code base. On the other hand, you have efferent coupling, uh, also called fan-out coupling. And uh, this coupling is how many other classes does your class use? So the matter with these two is they give an indication how fragile your class might be. Because if you depend on a lot of more or less primitives, classes, objects, structs from another, from another software bundle, um, it might break because, well, dependencies, dependencies can change. And when they change, and they are used in a lot of different places, these places might break. And um, there's a measure for instability that is basically efferent coupling divided by efferent coupling plus efferent coupling. So efferent divided by the general coupling. And this just means that if your class is more or less just a facade about um, or above another piece of software, it's not as uh, hit, hit as hardly by uh, the coupling effect uh, if it's more of a user kind of class. So it uses these other primitives than just uh, hide them. And last but not least, it can output the class relationships that I just talked about with, you know, the big ball of mud and the graphs that are not so easy to read. Uh, PHP metrics has the nice, uh, the nice benefit of outputting an HTML site as an artifact. So you can click around in it and uh, you can have a look at that. And it uses some uh, JavaScript, use some JavaScript to keep all the graphs uh, readable and you know, they highlight stuff, they make links to files. Um, and it also can tell you about the maintainability. So as I so, uh, told you, I've run this on Twig. And um, the thing about that is, you can see lots of circles going in, and um, all of these circles are a class. And uh, the size of this class is basically an indicator of how long it is. So, um, you know, tiny classes will be somewhere here, large classes will be outside, and their color uh, is representative of their maintainability, which is an aggregated score of um, all the metrics I've shown you before. Mm. So, you know, classes on top of here, very cherry red, quite big, they are probable, probable uh, breaking points in your application 
should you want to change something or should any of your dependencies decide to change something? Which is quite common because after all, um, your code is used by people and they may have changing um, requirements, but also you might find security bugs and that's the point where, hey, uh, we can't add another feature, it's no longer a valid uh, way to keep your code stable because, well, you've got to fix security issues. Um, although it is nice that PHP metrics generates like a ton of different stuff and values and graphs and even a whole HTML page, um, you want something that's more easy to digest. And that's why I want to recommend, recommend you PHP Insights. Um, PHP Insights is a bit young, it's very opinionated. Um, you definitely have to configure it if you run it because it disallows, uh, it disallows certain things like, I think it says no comments in code and are no circumstances, uh, which is not that good an idea. I mean, you shouldn't just like write everything your method does inside the method, but at some points, maybe you're using something magic and you want to document that in the code for the next guy because it will be useful. Um, and this is the output of it. Uh, I've just run it on a plugin I'm currently developing. And um, the really great thing why I like this is it's a CI, uh, CLI app. So um, for developers, it's quite natural. I mean, you're running your tests, you might as well run PHP Insights. And, and uh, this might say more about me than the tool, but I really like the fact that it's got color-coded output. I mean, uh, not only does it look kind of pretty for a uh, terminal app, it also, um, it's also rewarding to see like, uh, you know, a tool tells you, hey, you did well. And um, it's not to be underestimated, right? Because um, you want to feel good about your code and this helps you. Um, it does, you know, run some general analysis, like, yeah, how much comments do you have, classes, and uh, how big are your functions, stuff like that, it takes that apart. Then uh, you have a complexity measure, which is, as I told about, um, cyclomatic complexity, basically. And, um, well, we've got one, one um, point called architecture. And, um, I mean, it's maybe a bit of a controversial misnomer because um, architecture is more like how people envision software to be and how to how it's modularized, how it depends upon different parts of the software. And so um, this does not do that. So <laughs> architecture might be more aptly called clean code. It checks that your interfaces are not too big. It checks that you don't have functions that take like a million parameters, stuff like that. Uh, what I'm not showing you here, but it's pretty neat, um, the issues it's fine, it finds, uh, it will show you them in the CLI uh, with a bit of interaction, so you can scroll through them uh, one by one. And um, they are a mixture of like Slevomat style, uh, style recommendations, but also concrete ways where your function, uh, function header might be too big or um, you might have like a gigantic cyclomatic complexity somewhere in a function, like if you put a for each in a while and then uh, an if as well. So um, these are the tools, these are the general tools that um, I wanted to show you, right? These are the tools that we can use to keep our code clean. But here's the thing, we're, uh, we're software developers and not gardeners. So this does not cut it, right? We need automation, we need the really big guns. So um, for that, I mean, I recommend you CI. Um, I think it's quite well adapted by now that a um, lot of you will use some form of CI, maybe nightly, maybe continually. Um, I mean, no, right? But the thing is, just because you have your checks running in a server somewhere, does not mean you should not use local. You, may, uh, you make these tools available locally. Um, because the thing is, your CI will always be slower than running it locally. Simply because you've got limited resources on your CI server 
And I've seen it myself at uh, Shopware. We have like 50 people committing on a project and the CI server will almost burst into flames because it's all these jobs getting queued and queued and queued and then maybe somebody finds another bug, does another rebase or something like that, and every time the workload increases, 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 and every time the CI fails, you will 100% get another merge, requ uh, you know, get another task for the CI because, well, the developer fixed it. And this means that running a task might take quite a while to get scheduled. So you push your uh, code in the repository, you open up a merge request, and uh, suddenly you need to wait like half an hour on the result of your static analysis and tests. And when they fail, that's the moment where people say, oh, this is just shit. Oh, man, uh, I'm really down. I'm really angry because, you know, just a lot of time and you expect it to, uh, to run successfully. So the key takeaway I want to take you is you need to keep the friction low, right? You need to lubricate it. And uh, what better way to do that, what better way to do that than um, making your tools available locally? But the thing is in PHP, um, if you were to go naively about adding these tools, you might put them in your composer dependencies or force people to install them globally. Installing them globally is a bit bad because you have to tell people that. It's hard for them to find out themselves because it needs to be documented somewhere. And um, to keep a separation, but still have it uh, running automatically, I can just warmly recommend you the Bamani Composer Bin plugin. Um, it's quite a neat invention. You basically install this plugin into a composer file, and then the composer bin command will allow you to have namespaces for your composer dependencies. You're basically automatically building tiny composer projects in each of these namespaces. And uh, in this case, I have a PHP, I have a PHP stand um, namespace, and require PHP stand in it. That's all. Um, the composer bin plugin will then automatically go open up a new composer JSON in um, the PHP stand folder, um, more precisely in the bin slash PHP stand folder, and um, it will manage the dependencies there. So you no longer have a problem with dependencies because your CLI tools might update at different rates. And when you know a very common dependency like Symfony's command updates, then um, your tools might break because they all want a different version of Symfony, right? Some updated, some didn't. Maybe the project's uh, gone a bit into a hiatus. And uh, so you want that encapsulated. And the bin plugin helps you with that. So uh, the result of running these commands is just this file tree. Uh, you have a vendor bin folder. And in the vendor bin folder, you find your namespaces, the composer, JSONs and logs for it, and it also installs um, the vendor, the vendor folders, just fetches the dependencies. And you can also run stuff like composer bin all. So if you want to update your tooling, you just have to run one command to update all your tools at once. And um, the thing is, uh, the thing that makes this really good is that you now have tools like spread across the file system, um, but the Composer plugin does another neat thing. It symlinks the executables you find in each and every one of these vendor bin folders to your main vendor bin. So for the user, it looks like these are dependencies of your project in use, you know, like vendor, bin, PHP stand, something like that. But in reality, they're encapsulated, and you're not in dependency hell with these uh, applications. Next thing. Um, I mean, having encapsulated tooling that comes with your, uh, with your repository is very nice. But um, what I also want to tell you is you got to still make it a bit more easier. Most people don't want to run like five commands 
to get everything installed. And so, I mean, I prefer Makefile, for example. Uh, it's an old and better proven tool. Uh, the syntax is admittedly a bit weird, but uh, with stuff like uh, Makefile, you can just encapsulate even your commands. Like, the easy coding style will check in, uh, will check in dry mode, and then you've got another command to just append a fix. I mean, you might say, oh great, this saves you like five characters, but it adds up. It's just uh, accelerating your point. And um, I mean, the same for the static analysis. You can uh, just add more and more tools there um, the same way they run in your CLI. And with stuff like, uh, with stuff like uh, these pipes, you can also uh, require different commands running in order. So it will automatically run a composer install before it runs your tools if it doesn't find a composer log file or something. Um, of course, there are some alternatives. Um, you might want to prefer writing plain shell scripts. That's totally fine as well and also more compatible with most common CIs um, or even PHP. I got a colleague that wrote basically a whole um, build tool in PHP uh, to run shell scripts in a more organized fashion. And uh, I mean, there are thousands of other ways. I mean, you could use uh, whatever kind of make file. Like, I guess CMake would be a possibility if you're into that, or um, outlander stuff like writing your own tool, right? Your own application and something else, maybe JavaScript or something. For all I care, you might input it into NPM. Uh, the most important part is that, uh, is that it's easy for your developers to use your tooling. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for attending my talk, and I wish you all a good day.